TVS, America's number one independent television network, presents the following sports exclusive. TVS presents NASL Championship Soccer. NASL Championship Soccer is being sponsored by the people who bring you the light, refreshing taste of Coca-Cola. Coke adds life to the games you're playing and the life you're living. And by Toyota, makers of quality built cars and trucks. Hopes you will enjoy today's soccer game. You asked for it, you got it. Toyota. And by the Miller Brewing Company, brewers of Miller High Life. If you've got the time, we've got the beer. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, gang, how are you? Tim Hanlon here, uh, as announced, and uh, I welcome you to our curious little podcast devoted to what used to be in professional sports that we call Good Seats Still Available. Thanks for coming by. And uh, today's a, a fun one, and especially if you were a sports fan uh, in the 1970s, uh, especially if you also had a television in the 1970s, uh, where you were watching uh, two uh, very interesting and very colorful leagues, uh, and some of which were uh, brought to you by our guest today uh, on television by, by the name of Howard Zuckerman. And Howard's an interesting guy because not only for a legacy career in television, which we talk quite a bit about in television sports in particular, uh, but he was in the directors and producers chairs uh, for many of the broadcasts that you saw of the World Football League in 1974 and the North American Soccer League in 1977 and 1978. Uh, the place in which he did all that was a an interesting and spirited little television network called the TVS Television Network. Uh, and uh, that was the brainchild of uh, sports uh, executive Eddie and television executive Eddie Einhorn. And uh, and Howard was uh, in the uh, in the seat calling all the shots uh, for uh, a bunch of those uh, those telecasts that were uh, rich and colorful, um, some of which unfortunately are, are not easily found. Uh, hopefully some of our audience may uh, know where some of these uh, missing shows are, uh, but there are quite a few of those, especially the NASL variety uh, on YouTube, and, uh, and we're also going to do our best to try to dig up some of the uh, some of the theme music that uh, was on the TBS television network for the World Football League and the North American Soccer League, and uh, some of the stories behind all of that with our guest Howard Zuckerman uh, in a couple of seconds. Uh, before we get to our uh, conversation with Howard, uh, again, a reminder and an admonition, please, to give us a try uh, on the Audible audiobook service, which we love uh, because not only have they been a gracious sponsor of our show thus far in our early days, uh, but it's a damn good service. And uh, an audiobook uh, is uh, truly not appreciated until you get a free uh, sample of such, which you can do, of course, by going to our little website devoted to giving you a chance to do so. And that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Again, audibletrial.com slash goodseats, where you, uh, yes, you listener out there in podcast land can get a free audiobook download of your choice from over 180,000 plus titles to choose from, uh, and a, a free one month uh, subscription, if you will, uh, to the Audible service. You can cancel at any time. Uh, it's kind of no risk. So um, uh, I highly encourage you to do it. And there's there's a really, it's a great environment, right, by which to uh, enjoy a book uh, when for whatever reason you cannot read, you do not feel like reading, your eyes are tired, you're driving, 
uh, some other distraction, but uh, uh, where your brain can at least uh, receive and in, in enjoy uh, storytelling at its finest. Again, audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free audiobook download and 30 day trial of Audible, our favorite and the one, the only audiobook service out there. Please give it a try. Give us a try. By doing so, uh, you're giving a little love to the show, and we love you for that indeed. All right. So let's move on to our discussion, our conversation, and our uh, fun times with uh, Howard Zuckerman, the former producer and director uh, of various sports telecasts. We get into a whole bunch of things in here, not only the NASL and the World Football League, but we talk about even uh, the uh, NCAA and the beginnings of that in the late 1960s. Hell, we even talk about the Las Vegas Posse of the Canadian Football League, if you remember that team. And uh, oh, yeah, a little thing called Live Aid that uh, Howard was the director and producer of. So let's waste no more time. Here's our chat with Howard Zuckerman of the old TBS television network. So uh, as you as you know, per my emails and whatnot, the um, the focus of this uh, podcast is around uh, teams and leagues and various things that don't exist anymore in professional sports. And um, Mm -hmm. my my real uh, interest is uh, I, I was piqued because I saw your name constantly popping up in uh, various North American Soccer League uh, broadcasts from the old TVS network. Um, but right. as, as I dug a little deeper into your history, right, you you obviously were part of TVS prior to that, too, with the WFL. Maybe before we even get into that, I'd love maybe for our audience to understand sort of how you even came across this thing called the TVS television network well, that's real. That's a real simple question. Uh, I was working for WKBD in Detroit, which was owned by Kaiser at that time. This was in the early '60s, if I'm not mistaken. Somewhere in there, I can't remember the dates already. But it was back there then. I I was a production manager for WKBD in Detroit, uh, which was Channel 50 at the time. The station had just gone on the air, and they went on the air as an all-sports station. Uh, We had sports broadcasting all day long, or sports-oriented programming all day long, uh, as long as we were on the air. Uh, It was owned by Kaiser, as I said. And Eddie Einhorn uh, had just started up his little... TVS network, and he was going around the country, and he was picking up uh, basketball games primarily uh, that nobody else was interested in at that time. It was all college basketball, and he came to uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan, or or someplace out in that neck of the woods, and he came to uh, Channel 50 uh, in Detroit and said, I'd like to hire your mobile unit. Uh, so I went along with the mobile unit as a director and we went out to Ypsilanti or wherever it was and we did a game. And he, he and I hit it off pretty well, uh, and it worked out real well. And then the next week he called me up and said, come to here. And I don't remember where here was, but I went to the, to the next game for him. And basically that started us. He then hired me to do the rest of the, uh, of his uh, series with the, I'm trying to think which conference it was. Uh, was it Mid-America? Maybe it was a Mid-America conference, yes. And he uh, hired me to finish up the Mid-America conference for that year. And after that was over, he hired me again to start uh, to handle as, uh, as be his production manager for the rest of his series. At that point, he had uh, acquired uh, not only the Mid America, I think it was that, but we had the Big Ten. We had the, we had almost every we had over eleven conferences, and the series was that we would do a national game, uh, either early or late uh, on Saturday, depending on where where it was, uh, and uh, that was most likely UCLA and Notre Dame, uh, you know, the larger schools. And uh, they would do the national game, and they would go to to the whole the rest of the country. Then before or after the game, again, depending on time, uh, we would have a regional game. 
So that meant we had uh, t- usually 10 regionals followed or in front of the national game. And I supervised the production of all of those games. And uh, he and, and a guy by the name of Alan Lubell, and I'm trying to think of it, Chris Zalamas, uh, were out selling this. And we had almost 85% or 90% of the country uh, watching these telecasts. And this went on for almost 15 years. And uh, so but we to, had the to, end to, to back up for a second. So we're talking we had, about we're, we're talking about kind of the, the, the late 1960s here. And essentially what you're describing is Einhorn basically discovering or or figuring out that college basketball could be a more than just local regional television thing. And and to the point where, you know, it almost uh, arguably look at sports historians would say that, you know, the game like the UCLA Houston game in the Astrodome in 68. Right was almost right. like the national arrival of college basketball on on television, that's, right? That's right. Yeah, we, we did the, we did the UCLA uh, Houston game, uh, and uh, one of us little give you a quick story here. One of the things is uh, Einhorn in the early days uh, used to sit out on the floor with the announcers. He'd sit next to them. And he he was almost our stage manager. Uh, at that point. And on the UCLA Houston game, uh, all of a sudden on the big screen in the arena, while we were, while Dick Enberg was out there doing the opening for us, uh, all of a sudden up on the screen pops up the words of the national anthem. And everybody in the arena starts to stand up. Well, you're looking at like 50,000 people are now standing up ready to sing the national anthem. And Einhorn picks up a phone that he had out there, which went to the control room uh, upstairs for the arena, and yells into him, no, 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 wait, up. at least two minutes or so. And they, they stopped. They didn't display anymore. And everybody's standing up watching Enberg do his, his ending. And then finally Enberg sits down, and Eddie picks up the phone and says, go. And we disappeared through a commercial. And they played the national, and they played the national anthem. Well, he had control of fifty thousand people all at once. <laughs> so it, was, it was just a funny story that happened that night. So, well, that's also evidence that um, you know, obviously, a lot of, of what you're describing and what we're going to describe in, in a couple of minutes here uh, does re- revolve around Eddie Einhorn. Do you do you want to maybe take a few minutes and kind of describe sort of the relationship that you developed with him and or uh, what you sensed his television? Uh, essence was and his uh, prescience, frankly, because he obviously saw things well, that others didn't at that time, right? He had he had graduated out of North out of Northwestern, and uh, his roommate, as a matter of fact, I'm trying to remember uh, whoever he what his name was, o- wind up owning the uh, Chicago Bulls uh, and the uh, baseball team and one of the Chicago baseball teams. And Jerry Reinsdorf. I had a piece of it. Yeah, Jerry Reinsdorf, right. And uh, he and Eddie were uh, uh, roommates uh, while they were both going to uh, Northwestern. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when this was when this was all ended, uh, Einhorn was invited by Reinsdorf uh, to buy a piece of the uh, Chicago White Sox, which he did. He did do. And uh, he had Eddie had sold uh, at the end of the TVS where we were starting to have problems. We were on the NBC owned and operated stations, which there were seven of them at that point. He had arranged to get, get himself on those stations in the, in the NBC markets. Uh, and they had kept going. And then in the end, at the end, it, it, he was starting to have problems uh, selling and clearing. Uh, now, this is maybe 15 years after he had already started CVS. Uh, they were starting to have clearance problems. Uh, so he sold off the, you know, all his remaining rights that he had to NBC, who took over the broadcast uh, and made and they had Eddie stay for another year or two uh, to continue running the business. And uh, then NBC took it over and they did the whole production. And we still, everybody, we, I did a, one of the conferences every week, and they took over doing the national game. Uh, it was a very interesting 
career. But he and I developed a really good working relationship. And uh, we would go, you know, we went to China together. We went to Russia together. And uh, it was a pretty good good life for 15 years there. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, growing up in the New York metropolitan area myself, I remember some of these, uh, I guess I'm trying to remember conferences now, ECAC Game of the Week, you know, Marv Albert and uh, Bucky Waters and, uh, you know, and, and That's seeing, right. yep, yep. And, and frankly, seeing this TVS and NBC Sports thing, you know, sort of as a co-producer or, uh, you know, production entity for this thing. So clearly right. you got NBC Sports right. basically going in college sports, right? No, uh, they, yeah, it is. Uh, and what I, you know, my memory doesn't remember everything, but uh, the NBC people were very happy with this deal because we had we did the, you know all the regional games, and they took on a national game, which was fine for them. As a matter of fact, the other little thing that they did, NBC in one of Eddie's good moves, with all his moves were very good. One of the things that he did was he he got NBC to produce the commercial reel, the ten reels that went out to all the other all the regional games uh, every week, and we used to spend a bunch of money uh, doing that every week to put ten commercial reels together because in those days we had developed a situation where we the commercials ran out of the truck. So uh, we, we t- had a machine uh, in the truck that ran the commercials on the regional games uh, rather than going back to the control room and sending it out, which, would, which saved a lot of money because in those days we used the telephone company to distribute the, uh, the games around. And if we had to go into a control room and then come out of the control room to the regional, it would have cost a lot of money. But so it, that it was one of the things yeah, so in many respects, then you, what you were doing, maybe unwittingly, was pioneering the sort of uh, the art, I guess, of syndicated live sports programming uh, in the United States. Yes, yes, we did. We did. We did. You know, we just didn't do basketball. We did a lot of other things. He, so we started the hockey, and not the hockey, the uh, uh, soccer with Pele from Brazil in uh, a New York team, and. Uh, it was, it was it, unfortunately that league had a had a lot of problems. All right. Well, before uh, before, we, the before we get there, because that's something I want to go a little bit deeper in, uh, no doubt. But um, uh, I, I guess I, I, maybe right. maybe as a prelude, though, I'm so it, it's so obviously success with college basketball, the NBC relationship going very well. You're going into the 70s. You've obviously become you and Eddie and the team have become very very good at at doing live productions and sports and, and whatnot. But in the in the early 70s, circa 73, 74, kind of walks in this thing, this mongrel, this uh, unknown entity known as the World Football League. Do you want to give us a couple of, do you want to give us a bit of a sense yeah. of sort of how that came about and, and what your perceptions of the beginnings well, of that it was the same, it, was a, it was almost like the same type of thing. Hey, we were looking for a TVS uh we were looking for any kind of product that we could have that would uh, he could keep, uh, keep the network going and make everybody happy, and that's what he did. Uh, he found uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name at the World Football League. Uh, Gary Davidson. They had just started up. Gary Davidson. That's right. Uh, I think that was it. Yeah, it was Davidson. And he he came to Eddie and said, "Look, I'm putting this together." And he has all these teams that we're going to have. Uh, would you be interested in televising this thing? And Eddie said, hell yes. And the next thing I knew, we were now doing football. Uh, and it was an interesting thing. There were things like they had that, uh, came up with the dicker rod. And the dicker rod was a device that was on the edge, which was on the end of the field, on the sidelines of the field, which measured the 10 yards that they had to get to go first down. Uh, that happened. There was a bunch of other little things like that that they did. But the one thing that I do remember from a long time ago was it was a team in Michigan, in Detroit, if I'm not mistaken. And they were run, They had a problem money-wise. And all I remember is that after one game, all of their towels and other supplies were repossessed by somebody, whoever owned them, whoever leased them to them, 
and they had a truck sitting outside the field uh, that night. And as soon as the game was over and the guys were taking showers or whatever else, all the towels left. They they had no more towels for that for the rest of the season well, unless the guys were all bringing their own stuff in to do, I, to play. According to my research, that uh, probably would have been the August twenty second, nineteen seventy four TVS game, the Chicago Fire at the Detroit Wheels. Yeah, yeah you're probably right. <laughs> well, give me some sense. You know, then. I did I did over in my career so far. I did over two thousand uh, sporting events. In the, in the 45 to 60, 50 years that we've been doing this. So I, I can't remember every game. I do remember the UCLA game with the, in the Astrodome. And I remember when I went down for that game, I went into the press box, I entered upstairs where they had the cameras for football. And that's where we were going to do, put, put two of our cameras right there side by side like football. And I used uh, extenders uh, lens extenders at that time uh, to get a wide shot because they were, we were so far back uh, in the stadium there. Did <laughs> did any did any of those techniques come in handy when when tackling per se uh, uh, the uh, football professional football? Uh, any techniques that came in handy in in uh, in how you decided to set up the uh, the scenario for covering WFL games every week? No, not really. We 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 knew what we had to do, and we had the coverage pretty well set up. And the football had been had been done a lot by uh, not necessarily college football, but uh, well, ABC did a did college football in the early days uh, every Saturday. They had, and they had a a deal with the NCAA at that time, and uh, I did some of the games for them too. And then back in the early days. Do you do you remember anything about the uh, the first ever WFL game that was broadcast? There is some YouTube uh, footage out there, uh, but um, it was uh, I, it was uh, in July of 1974, and the Jacksonville Sharks were hosting the uh, ill-fated New York Stars at the Gator Bowl. Do you remember anything about that first ever game uh, in your in your mind? I, yes, I do. I remember we I had uh, just worked with a bunch of people out in uh, uh, in Chicago. And we were raising, we had raised uh, money uh, for us to buy a uh, two two mobile units, and we were going to go lease those out to to the networks or anybody else, any other producers who wanted it. And I remember that we didn't have our unit was not finished for that first game, and we had hired a an, out, an outfit out of uh, uh, Canada uh, to come down and supply us with the equipment. And I, I think we did that game with like three ca- three cameras or something like that. It was real. We just didn't have all of the bells and whistles at that time. Uh, I'm trying to remember that. I think we did that in Jacksonville. Wasn't that right? That's correct. And um, uh, there was also something yeah. that happened at halftime. Do you remember what maybe happened at halftime during that game? While you were broadcasting? No, I don't remember. Uh, okay. Um, based Ooh. on, on the, the footage that I've seen, there was a power outage. Uh, in the midst. Oh of, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean you yes, had uh, yes, yes. you had uh, Merle Harmon calling the game, Alex Hawkins as the color commentator, and uh, in that case, a a, a third party, a, a rotating, I guess, sort of guest host. In this case, was George Plimpton. And uh, during the during the halftime, there was uh, you know this the uh, you know the, the the pleasantries, and and Commissioner Davidson came on and said a few things, and then. Uh, again, this is a YouTube clip, so I wasn't watching the game in 74. Uh, the, the, the the signal goes out, and then you see Merle Harmon trying to kind of stammer his way through about 10 minutes of vamp to get uh, while the power came back on. Apparently, the entire yeah. stadium lost power that night. That's right, yes. And the only reason why we didn't lose power that night is that we were connected to a different power source uh, than the stadium. Uh I, if I remember correctly, we had a bring in a power. We had a we went to the power company down there and had them drop another power line into the outside of the stadium where the truck was parked. We had a lot of power problems uh, over the years. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. There was one other game that we had the same problem with. So the 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 uh, the actual mechanisms or the mechanics of of of, a, of these WFL games, as I said, you had. 
you had a you had a, you had a lead uh, a broadcaster in Merle Harmon, uh, Alex Hawkins, who was Merle a, Harmon. Yeah. yeah so uh, yep. Alex Hawkins, who was a former uh, Baltimore Colts uh, running back, as a uh, some would call him sort of as a um, a gadfly, I guess, sort of a sort of good old kind of you know hang around uh, informal kind yeah, of. Yeah, he was. He was. He was a he was a great guy too. Well, all, mostly, let me say this: that all of the TVS talent that Eddie had found, or whatever, uh, were really super people, and uh, I'm still friendly with uh, I'm friendly with all of them. But I was really friendly with Dick uh, Enberg, uh, who is out here now doing. Uh, I think he does San Diego baseball. Uh, he was he was a good find that we had got, and he he had been found by. Uh, Eddie through uh, J.D. Morgan, who was the athletic director of UCLA, uh, when Eddie had made the deal to do uh, to do the UCLA Houston game, uh, one of the re- requirements of doing that game by J.D. Morgan was, "Hey, take my guy that I, that's doing our our games out here and bring him in to do the uh, the game." And uh, Ed, Eddie agreed to that, and. Uh, that was a good start for Enberg again, uh, who worked for Eddie every weekend, did the national game. And now as a result of that, he wound up going to uh, NBC. And I think he all went over to CBS too. When Eddie went to CBS uh, for a two year stint as the executive producer of the CBS Sports Spectacular uh, on Saturdays, uh, yeah. So um, it, uh, what, the clips that I have seen that that have survived, and by the way, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, uh, World Football League completists out there that would love to see uh, other games that were broadcast. I really think that, you know, I don't know if you've got a treasure trove of those sitting around in a garage somewhere, but uh, no, I, I unfortunately we don't. Uh, yeah, we don't. The only one that I had and, and I lost. Uh, we had lent it to ABC back in, uh, or it was the UCLA Houston game. I had that entire game. And the only thing I got back from ABC, uh, unless they're holding it someplace, was the, the uh, was a 90 minute reel, which was basically started with the almost in the, starting in the second half. Uh, and Eddie used that in his book. He wrote the, a book, uh, and uh, they had a, uh, a a CD disc of the, of the game of that much of the game came along with the, uh, with, with his book. Yeah. I will say what does survive. And I've seen on YouTube, I mean, look, looks like very high quality, uh, television production for football, right? I mean, Merle Harmon, I mean, wh- where did he come from? Because he almost became kind of like the voice of TVS, like doing promos and, and set up, right? Uh, he's, his name is, yeah, his he, voice he is- was, he came out of Milwaukee, if I'm not mistaken. He came, Eddie found him in Milwaukee. And, uh, as a result of that, uh, Harmon then became a uh, an owner of uh, stores of sports media and sports stuff. Uh, he had his stores and uh, shopping centers all over the country for a while there. And where where did the idea for these guest commentators, these sort of third persons in the booth thing, come from? Was that your idea? Was that a spur of the moment idea? Was that an Eddie idea? Uh, I think I think it was I think it was Eddie's idea. Uh, he always wanted to put on as many commentators as he could. Uh, I used to fight with him on some of them because it became unmanageable uh, to have, especially in the football, to have three guys in the booth. Uh, you know, I guess that. That may have been why ABC did it with Howard Cassell. I uh, had the three guys in the booth. It was all right. Well, you had, you some, know, great, you, you had some great names in there. You had George Plimpton and McLean Stevenson and Burt Reynolds and yeah. Dick Buckus and Rosie yeah. Greer. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we had a whole we had a whole, a whole family there of, of, of a few guys. And we would hold a, a general meeting uh, before each season with everybody who was going to be doing like on the basketball except they never came to any one place for the meeting. He would do it on a conference call, and we'd have maybe 30, 40 people on this one conference call uh, outlining how we're going to do whatever we're going to do. Well, it must have been a bit We mad. did a lot of things to save money. We did a tremendous amount of things 
to cut the cost down of doing these events. Well, it must have been maddening, though, for you as a production person, right, to have to deal with a third entity in the booth that's different every week who doesn't necessarily understand the, shall we say, sensibilities of a, of a professional television broadcast, right? I mean, a, a Burt Reynolds. Well, or a, there, there were some problems, but not really. I think everybody just uh, who he has find, found absorbed the uh, how, how to do it. And they did it. Most of these guys did it by their own, where they uh, usually the uh, the play by play guy and the color guy and the third person would have, would get together before the game got on and decide who's going to do what and who's going to tell what. And it, it worked out really well. So, what was your sense br- br- bringing these games and putting these games together every week? What was your sense of the of the league itself? It seems like it started out with a big blast in the beginning, and then started to melt away relatively quickly. When did you? Well, I think what happened is I think what happened is the teams to to, to continue to survive ran out of money. It was very simple. They all all of the uh, all the things that they they gave away and promised and stuff. I think killed the league. Uh, they would give away, you know, a uh, 20, uh, 40, 40,000 seat stadium. You might have one third of that is free, was free. They gave to uh, any unsold seats and stuff like that. Went to some college campus or to somebody, uh, some charity organization. They to continue to fill the stadiums so that people watching on the TV and so forth would say, hey, that's a good idea. Let's go there. It looks like a hell of a set a setup. Uh, in essence, it was, but uh, a lot of the seats in there were, were freebies. It um, it seems that uh, a number of stations that kind of signed on in the beginning of that season started to kind of melt away as the season went on. Did you did you sense that this was a bit of a sinking ship at some point? And if so, when did you kind of get that inkling? Well, I think the problem became. Nationally, we sold it pretty well, but I think the regional spots, uh, in other words, every station had to ha- had carried out the game, and it was almost like a barter situation where we ran X number of commercials in the, in the game for na- nationally, and then each station got X number of spots uh, for them to sell locally. And I think what happened is uh, a lot of them was were, were now – uh, carrying the games basically for free because they were having problems selling the local positions. Uh, you know, it, it, it was not like the regional basketball because there was not a regional game, you know, on each station. There was just a national game on the WFL. So they, they were having trouble selling it. I mean, if you had a station in New York, for example, uh, that was carrying the game, and there was no New York team, or no New York team uh, being televised that day. They would have a hell of a time uh, selling a, uh, uh, a uh, an Indianapolis station selling a game that was not coming out of Indiana or did not have the Indiana team playing that day. Yeah, you, That's you what killed the television. Right, and you also had <clears throat> it seemed like an ending, an unending sort of set of uh, I don't want to say lies or or. Uh, uh, misappropriations, I guess, and, and the stories, I guess, got harder and harder to kind of, you know, control or suppress, so to speak. And, and I think that also sort of aided in the, I guess, the credibility factor, right, uh, of the league. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, all of a sudden, you'd have a team that would go bankrupt and disappear. Uh, all of a sudden, we were left with a situation where the game of the of the week that we, that year, or well, that month, or whatever. Was had a problem. We didn't have a, a an opponent for them because they were playing another game someplace. So that was part of the problem. So did did you worry personally about? I mean, you know, as a job, I mean, you know, <laughs> teams and uh, seem to be relocating and whatnot, and 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 the the ratings seem to go down, the stations seem to be going down. I mean, did you ever did anybody ever start talking about it or questioning? You know, the whole enterprise as the season went on. No, because we were well, I was anyway. I was a, you know, at this base gig at that point in my life, I was a freelancer and I had my own production company here, but, uh, and we, you know, we ran a lot of the business through me, uh, sort of payroll and things like that for the television end of the thing. 
Uh, you know, I did, but Eddie stood behind uh, all the TV thing, and we we never had a money problem on the TVS side. Uh, we would have problems of uh, the the teams were having the money problems, and that's what ended the, the WFL. Do you remember? Uh, I think Davidson, when he started the league, did not have enough cash behind him uh, to maintain it. I think if they had maintained it for another year. They probably would have had a. They would have been a big problem uh, against the other football league here in town. Well, it's it's my understanding that I guess TVS was in the mix to come back in 1975 in the reconstituted WFL, but uh, clearly that didn't uh, that didn't occur. And I wonder, uh, you know, did you miss having a second season, or were you kind of like, ah, that was a fun experiment, but uh, you, you know, uh, well, let's time I, move on. I I went on to do other things. It was. There was enough business for me, uh, and I think for Eddie also. When Eddie sold this out to the to NBC, uh, and and then said sayonara, and, and then his friends at one of his friends at CBS called him one day and said, "Come over here, we need an executive producer on the Saturday afternoon on the Saturday afternoon sports spectacular." Uh, you know, he he went, he took Chris Salamis with him over to CBS. And uh, that lasted, I think, for a whole maybe two years. And then he said, the hell with it, I'm going to retire. Uh, all right. Before we move on from the WFL, are there any any games or any uh, situations or, or, or personalities or, or things that popped up or that, that you somehow remember that were either crazy or silly? No, the, or, the, only thing I re- the only thing I really remember about the WFL was to the end where they 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 got back all the towels uh, in in Detroit in the Detroit game they were in Detroit I think we were in Michigan someplace when that happened and there were other teams that had the same problems uh, he was lucky if he he was able to finish the the second year I think uh, of the league if it went, I think it went for two years. All we right. were actually we, we didn't know where we were going to go for the next game. Towards the end, there we didn't know if we were scheduled to go to Jacksonville. We also might, uh, I, as a matter of fact, sometimes I would send the mobile unit out and we'd say, "Call us on on Friday, wherever you're driving, and we'll tell you which way to go, <laughs> whether to go to Florida or continue going where you're going." So there were some weeks that we didn't know what the next game was going to be. It's it's mind blowing. I mean, it's just it, it's just it's got to be. I mean, at some point you have to laugh, right? I mean, I know it's it's you know you got to be where you. Oh be, yeah, but... we were laughing. We were laughing all the way because there was, we had enough. We had enough dollars and so forth in the in the setup uh, to pay everybody our own people off and to make sure that if nobody got really burned uh, on our end anyway. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called the national forgotten league by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and audible's got it by the way, two, uh, two guests perhaps that we'll have on the show hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30-day trial as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now, 
back to our conversation. All right. Well, let's uh, let's uh, move a little bit further down the decade then to this thing called the North American Soccer League. Uh, do you want to? You have any prelude to that? How to have that relationship and conversation? And, uh, and I the- I think I think uh, whoever the New York team uh, New York Cosmos had contacted had contacted Eddie and said, "Hey, they they that they were putting this league together with Davidson." And uh, no, it wasn't Davidson. I'm trying to think. Yeah, the NASL had been had been around had been around for for a bunch of years since the late '60s, but but it was only becoming newly ascendant in the '74 '75 season because you had more and more teams, and CBS had kind of played around with a couple of games uh, nationally. Yeah, yeah, CBS was the had to be doing some, and then when Pele showed up in the uh, New York team, uh, that I think sparked some interest, uh, and that. Was a, and we 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 then picked up the the soccer uh, league. Uh, that we were doing only one one game a week, a national game. Uh, I'm trying to remember the soccer. I know that uh, that was that was a good run that we had with that. So, but like anything else, mm-hmm. they they end things on TV don't continue forever and ever. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, he would have Eddie would have trouble doing two things because he didn't have. Remember, this was an ad hoc network, basically meaning that it just sprouted up at like whenever he had an event to do. Uh, and he, he would be able to get the stations to come back on. I think we were having sales problems on the soccer league because it had, soccer hadn't become a major sport in the United States yet, like it is today. And they did a hell of a soccer league, did a hell of a job getting the, starting with the kids to, to play soccer. And that sparked a lot of interest. But look how many years it took till we got the soccer league today. Yeah, I got the sense that, uh, especially on the NASL broadcasts, I mean, I lived in the New York area at the time, and, and those games were mostly, from what I remember, uh, presented live. So we were lucky in that regard. But there were plenty of stations uh, that were not broadcasting those games until even Monday night at 10, 11.30 the next day, right? Which is which is kind of a graveyard for a live sports presentation, right? Right. Yeah. So, any anything you remember about uh, approaching the sport of soccer, right? In many respects, kind of a literally and figuratively foreign sport. Well, right? I still right? I still disagree with some of the coverage that's on right there now. I like to go tighter. If you look at soccer that's on right now, they use a wide shot which you can only see high half the field in uh, to see see what's going on. Where I'd like to, I used to have a big, I'm trying to remember who the guy was from the, the soccer league. He and I used to have arguments all the time about whether we should be tighter in coverage and so forth. I like to get tighter. I like to, I would like to, I did that on football too. Uh, is once the, uh, the team has set and you have established where everybody is, I used to go push in tighter to see where the ball is going to go. And uh, on the soccer league right now, I'm watching soccer, is they use one enormous wide shot, which you can see almost every every player in the in the, on the field. <laughs> and then occasionally they'll cut to something close. Uh, I'm I don't like that. I mean, it's, it's a, just a, that was my own personal opinion. Yeah, how did you right, how did you approach and handle uh, the unique flow of a soccer match, right? And and the potential to miss goals and action and and artificially insert commercial breaks and all that kind of stuff. That's had, had to be a new experience for you, right? Yeah, the, well, the commercials in the soccer because it continued, they didn't there were no timeouts. We finally got uh, on the soccer league uh, that we were televising. We got them to agree. Uh, to have a have a couple of pauses in the game that we can throw some commercials in there, uh, and so there was some fake. I don't want to call them fake. I guess, but that's what it was. There were some fake uh, downings where somebody got hurt, and they theoretically stopped the game and that kind of stuff uh, because there were no commercial breaks in there, not like they were in the other sports that were on TV. 
You're kidding. So there were uh, there, there were these sort of manufactured events to kind of slow the game down and create a sort of a, a, yeah, a natural they, break? They had the league had had it worked out with all the teams uh, that they were going to be a couple of stoppages in the game. The, the countdown clock continued to run while the uh, whatever was on the field had stopped, and uh, they continued to run until we, uh, you know. And that's why they added time at the end of the game, usually, uh, to make up for the for the four or five minutes that we had we had stuck in some commercials in the whole game. That's re- that's very interesting because uh, soccer historians, I'm sure, are yelling at their devices now as they're listening to this. We'll we'll remember in the uh, early days of pro soccer uh, in the late '60s uh, on CBS. Uh, they there was a bit of that those kinds of shenanigans, and frankly, not that sophisticated. Uh, where they created sort of fake fouls, et cetera, for, for, for commercials. You'd think that there would have been a different approach by 77 and 78, but it seems like not. Yeah, well, there was also, well, there was also a situation where in some cases, when, the, uh, when we went out for a commercial, we were still rolling uh, another tape machine uh, covering what was going on while we were away for a commercial. And if something had happened, in that you know, sixty seconds or or uh, two minutes that we were out, uh, we had tape of what had happened in the two minutes. And when we came back on the air live, we would show that particular thing again as why we were gone. Uh, this is what happened, you know, that, that kind of a thing. So, so nobody really missed any action in any of the games. Uh, most of the time, because nothing had happened in that period that we were out uh, for doing running a commercial. So we had uh, the uh, the color commentator for those matches, uh, Paul Gardner, who was uh, uh, an esteemed uh, soccer journalist uh, on a couple episodes ago. Uh, anything you remember about him and his um, his partner, John Miller, uh, obviously now very famous baseball broadcaster about uh, uh, th- those first games uh, and doing soccer on uh, TVS? No, no, I, I don't remember that. No, I that, it was another event for us. Uh, I don't remember anything, you know, spectacular about that. That exciting it was, huh? <laughs> uh, it, was, it was exciting. Uh, I think that the secret to, this, to those games in the early days was that we had a, a hell of a, ch- a crowd uh, attending the uh, the events. That That I remember. They had a hell of a crowd, and they were very intense on the game. Uh, they were really in for the teams and so forth. But a lot of it was foreign, uh, you know, uh, immigrants and things like that. People had come over here, whether they had left their original company, uh, country, uh, where they were very into soccer. I, you know, I'm living out here now in Los Angeles, and we've got the Galaxy out here. And uh, it's almost like it was back in the early 60s here with this guy. The, this team here is really uh got the city up up and and dancing over the over the the soccer yeah i'm, I, I'm rambling here no that's good I, I i it's interesting because again there, there are many more of those clips available on youtube and i and i've been a, a a student of them i guess shall we say and there are a few of us out there um and again i i i, I do think that the uh, the production value of those games uh, again, obviously in the late seventies, right? With you know, you have to sort of put that in perspective in the time frame. But still, like those WFL clips, uh, the production of those games was very high quality. And you know, oh, it point- was, it was, it was. We did we uh, in the first, I got I finally got Eddie to agree. For example, one little minor thing uh, on most of your NFL games and so forth, the production crew on that brings along. A lot of people with them. It brings along uh, their own camera guys, so you got the same camera crew on every game that you're doing, and you don't have to train uh, a, a new crew every time that you you go out there. And we did that on the uh, on the, the, those games. I finally got Eddie to agree to spending you know uh, you're, you're bringing five camera guys in addition. That's five additional people, which meant five different five additional hotel uh, taking care of us and, and airfare and whatever the heck you did when you went from one place to the other. Uh, that, that upped the production cost 
But at this point, he wanted, he said, yes, if that's what it's going to take, let's go do it. He was a good guy. Eddie was a great guy in terms of he liked to save money. And I, along with him, did the same thing. But we never we never got to where we uh, shorted the production value of doing that show. We, as far as I was concerned, they were all top notch. And they, we could put any one of those shows up against any one of the uh, the real commercial networks and so forth. One one thing I noticed on both the NASL broadcast and the WFL broadcast was the absence, that is, uh, the, the non-existence of sideline reporters. Was that ever thought about as a as an element, or was that rejected early on? Well, uh, we we that was a uh, if you if you two reporters or you two people in the booth or, or three in this case. Uh, we decided we really didn't need somebody on the field. I mean, if these guys could handle what it is, and we always had uh, on on all the games, both the soccer and the uh, and the football, we always had uh, a microphone set up down on the field, uh, so that if we decided to interview somebody uh, who just did something, uh, our stage manager down on the field there. With, or our producer, or our associate producer on the field, down on the field, could always go and get somebody if we wanted to interview him and, th- and put the headset on him, and uh, we would interview him from the booth. Not, not any big problem. So we still had all the good stuff that way. Um, we had on uh, our uh, our show a couple of weeks back a documentary uh, producer out of uh, London who uh, uh, had a recent ESPN 30 for 30 film called... Uh, uh, George Best all by himself, which is a story about George Best, who played for the Los Angeles Aztecs in the NASL and, um, you know, obviously had a, a legacy uh, soccer career internationally before coming to the NASL in the 70s. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a great story, even if you're not a huge soccer fan. But in the middle of that film, um, there's a sort of the end of, of George Best's uh, history and story at Manchester United and his arrival in the United States seeking a new sort of reset for his life. And the way that that's done in the film, which is partially why I reached out to you, is uh, they introduce it with the opening se- uh, sequence with the music and the uh, the uh, the cartoon art of the North American Soccer League broadcast. I think you will get a kick out of it, no pun, uh, because of your involvement in it. But um, I guess I'd love to hear your thoughts about, uh, if you remember any of it, where that music came from, which I think came also from the WFL games, too. Um you know, if I remember correctly, the theme music that we used for TVS, uh, Eddie had run into some uh, music producer or somebody out here in the West Coast. And Eddie went out, it was a big band guy, I'm trying to remember that, who it was. But he went out, out here, he came out to Los Angeles and spent about a week uh, auditioning a couple of music people and so forth. And finally came up with somebody who who wrote wrote the theme specifically for him. And so that music was made only for us and didn't wind up uh, with anybody else, to my knowledge, at this point. But, but, but Eddie found somebody out here, uh, and it, we got it. We got the music made. Now, I found a uh, an artist, a guy by the name of Jack Glasser, who I hope is still alive. Uh, Jack Glasser in Chicago, who did the animation, uh, uh, animation for us. That's my. That was my and, next. That was uh, my next question. Yeah, we did the animation here. The animation was done by a a, a, a artist in Chicago. Uh, he did a, he did all our graphics, all our uh, fixed graphics. With the and a lot of it was cut to the music, uh, so the music came first, and then the graphics followed after that. And it was the same theme, uh, if I remember correctly, for everything uh, that we did. Well, I'm going to do my best uh, as an outro for this uh, this interview is to uh, uh, find a, a clip of that music. And I'd obviously love to find, uh, and I'm sure there are people out there. We're going to put it out there to our audience who you'd be surprised can find uh, lots of different things from various nooks and crannies out there. Maybe an original copy of it. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to have a copy of whatever you find. (laughs) 
audio, yeah. some of those uh, those uh, uh, cartoon graphics, uh, those uh, those imagery, that you know, all of it. Uh, I you know, this uh, uh, this there's a lot of great little tidbits out there, but nothing hugely comprehensive, especially on the WFL front. Oh, as a matter of fact, I had Glasser, uh, the artwork that he did. I had him design the the artwork that went on the side of my two mobile units that I that we later came with a company called National Teleproductions, uh, which was well, I was uh, the president of, and we had the uh, his uh, glasses artwork on the side of both trucks. <laughs> One of the interesting things here is as you talk about these things, it all of a sudden triggers in my brain there other memories that have been way buried that I don't, you know, after 60 years of doing this, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of shows that there, a lot of water went under the bridge and I can't remember all of those things. But when you start talking about things, then I start remembering uh, what happened. All right. Well, let's let's try to do a little lightning round as we try to uh, round out here uh, for uh, again, because oh. our because our little podcast is focused on teams and leagues and things that don't exist anymore. Um, I'll, I'll give oh, it a okay. shot and see if you remember any of these names or if there's anything particular that pops up. It's oh, OK if you don't, but let's try. Um, OK, go ahead. All right. So uh, uh, the Los Angeles Express of the USFL. I, yeah, I, th- I think a lot of that came from KT. KTLA, what was it? Channel Five here, uh-huh. which was uh, uh, they were they were doing televising a lot of stuff, a lot of the the soccer here, and, and the, the and they had a contract locally. Uh, they were doing UCLA and oh, they had USC. They were doing a lot of college stuff here at that time, and that's how Eddie had gotten into involved with uh, JD Morgan, uh, who was the athletic director. Uh, from uh, UCLA, uh, got it. That's how the uh, the Witch Court game got done. UCLA Houston game. And I'm assuming okay, got interesting. And I'm assuming that uh, your preseason work with the uh, then Los Angeles Raiders and the then Los Angeles Rams came about from that sort of relationship too, right? Yes, it did. I I did the Rams and the and the Witch Court and the uh, Rams and the. You just said it a minute ago. Raiders, now, so Raiders, that's a, yeah. My memory goes away. L.A. Raiders. Uh, yeah, the Raiders, yes. Uh, that's okay. Al Davis. Uh, I remember those days with Al here. Okay, and, uh, uh, here, here's one. How about, do you remember the uh, Canadian Football League's uh, 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 efforts in the United States, especially with a team called the Las Vegas Posse? Anything I remember? Yes, I do. Yeah, I do. I do remember that one. Uh I, I televised the posse, all of their, their their games with them, and we went up. We went to Canada a couple of times with them, and uh, and I remember there was one one with them when they did, went to Sacramento, California. They did one game up in Sacramento. Yes, the and surge, the, power, the, Sa- the Sacramento Surge, I believe, was the team. Go ahead. Yeah, what was? And the power went out in the. The whole of Sacramento, everybody in the Sacramento Stadium there, there was not enough power to run the TV trucks or to run anything in that place. And everybody was running on generators, portable generators. And we had uh, one game we were, the the game we were doing up there that night, uh, our generator died with a bad, because of a bad load of fuel. Uh, here we are on diesel generator. It had a bad low of, load of fuel, and the fuel clogged up the the engine and everything else, and the power went out, and we lost that game. And the owner of the of the uh, the, the team of the Las Vegas team went absolutely bananas because we had knocked off his his feed to uh, Las Vegas that night, and uh, we didn't get it back on and almost until the fourth quarter. And uh, everybody who was watching the game had gone someplace else. And it, that lost him a big promotion uh, factor. Uh, but they sold a lot of seats in Vegas uh, based on the television. And uh, I remember we lost power there. And there was one other game that I did that we lost power yeah. What, so, what, g- given your experiences in the WFL and obviously in in, in previous uh, NFL and other football games, what, what was your thought about the CFL at the time coming to the United States and the extended field and all of that? Well, you think it was going to make it. There were 
So it, it, it was interesting because there were some rule differences, and don't ask me what they were, but I remember that one of the biggest things that we all had to get used to was there were different kind of rules uh, in the uh, in, a, in the CBA in the CIA, in the Canadian Football League uh, than we had experienced in the United States here. Uh, I think it was a timing problem also. But the, the same thing happened there. He, he he started to run out of money. And that's what killed that league. Uh, that killed with the American thing because you couldn't get a, a, a good audience to come and buy seats uh, And uh, that once that happened. Well, we've uh, we've only started kind of our, our our journey into lots of teams and leagues and stuff. But it's one one sort of theme is certainly popping up uh, again and again, and that is one well, a couple of them. One football never seems to kind of be uh, uh, unpopular, right? There's there always seems to be somebody, some entity, some group that wants to create either a challenger to the NFL, an alternative to such, uh, for whatever reason, uh, and and owners who for whatever reason, are not part of the NFL or have not been invited to become part of that club to kind of try it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's just it's interesting because you've you've seen a whole bunch of different leagues that have come and gone in, in, in football. Um, you know, I, I, you've got to look at somewhat amuse with some kind of amusement, I guess, uh, as all your legacy production uh, uh, heritage, um, you know. Well, I think a lot of the, a lot of the problems that went on here were all dollar re- related. Uh when the people started getting one of these things, uh, and the other thing that went with it, all of a sudden the, the payment to the players has jumped up tremendously in order to keep a guy. You know, these guys are getting like a million dollars a week or something like that in some cases. Uh, to play a lousy 60 minutes of football, uh, that's what, what killed a lot of this right now. And I understand where they're coming from, because in the football side of the thing, you've got tremendous injuries and things like that, which could really knock somebody right out of out of his uh, livelihood. And that's why they're getting so much money, uh, because they do. They what do they finish 30, 35 years? You know, when they become thirty-five or forty, and they 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 retire, which they've been hit in the head too many times, and. Uh, I think the violent nature of football is why you've got a lot of people watch this. They like people like to see violent things, and that's in my opinion. I don't, but the, that's what what they like. That's why they show up at stadiums. Uh, so, you know, yeah, that's it. I, I hope I haven't rambled too much. No, yet. this is good. So I got I got two more uh, two more questions for you. So, um, do you think, um, looking back on your on your career, especially in sports television, uh, that uh, cable television, right, which is clearly a huge force in sports today and arguably is the, you know, is maybe the reason why people still subscribe. Um, do you think that it would have been different for, say, the WFL or the NASL if cable had been around at that point? Because it seems like you were kind of doing some of the things that cable now kind of does. I don't know. I don't think that would have happened. The problem with that, that they have right now with cable here is like in LA right now is you got too much on the air. Uh, it becomes a real big problem. All of a sudden, um, one night, uh, uh, and this was what happened in college football, in college basketball also, you're not going to have, uh, in the days of TDS, we had an exclusive arrangement for the basketball where we only, we would, uh, on Saturday afternoons, or Saturday, Saturday, basically, we had the exclusive all day. We were the only television until maybe at 10 o'clock, 8 or 9 o'clock that night. You might have another game going on. But now on Saturday afternoons, uh, because there's no exclusive like TDS had it, you could have four or five different games going on at the same time on four or five different networks all at the same time. And as a result of that, nobody's made, the guy that's uh, advertising that was advertising on TVS had the exclusive basketball uh, situation. Uh, now he's got uh, where he's got five basketball games on at the same time. Where does he put his his money? And so what they've done is almost divided up the the one 
dollar event that he had before uh, is now divided up amongst five guys. Uh, and that's, that's what's been hurting here. Uh, that's just my opinion at this moment. Yeah, I think um, it was I, I much think, better when we had only one team on the air. Yeah, well, I, I think people kind of forget. I might have said, look at this, for example, the WFL, right? Which you know, by by all accounts, was uh, 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 something to see and its in its demise. But you know, in in those first couple of weeks, I mean, you had uh, you know, you were getting fives and sixes and seven point sh- uh, ratings uh, for national yeah. televised audiences, which is you know, was a significant amount of people back then. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. It was. But it started to fall off because everybody wanted to see their own local team. That's that's what I believe has happened, and that that wasn't going to happen on the uh, on the WFL. We were doing it in the college basketball uh, because we were dealing with a local situation. He was Eddie was dealing with, you know, with uh, we did ten ten or eleven games every Saturday, uh, and uh, he was dealing. He had he had gotten enough enough of these teams enough of the leagues together enough of the conferences uh, to control what happened. So he would only let one one thing happen on Saturday afternoon, and there was always a local game or a regional game on Saturday along with the national game. And I think when they sold this stuff, they only they they the guys could determine where what conferences or whatever they wanted to be in. And that happened. All right. Last question. And I kind of buried this, uh, but uh, uh, a little known fact, or at least for me was uh, in your, in your long and uh, esteemed career in television production was this little concert in 1985 called live aid. What, what was that all about? Yeah. Well, uh, I, there was a, a guy here. Uh, there was a producer, uh, What's that? Well, I'm trying to remember names here. Uh, it wasn't Bob Geldof, was it? Rolled. Yeah, well, Geldof, Geldof was brought into this thing by Mike. Mike, uh, what was Mike's name now? Wait, hang on just a minute. I happen to have all that. I have a big live aid uh, poster on my wall here. Okay, Hal Uplinger was was one of the guys, and, and uh, that was uh, the producer of this thing. Was he was along with a uh, Hal Uplinger and uh, CBS, a CBS guy who worked director Tony Verna. All right, They're, unfortunately both of them have passed away, but uh, they the two of, two of them were, were, were became friends with me a long time ago, a long time on other events that we did where they had used my facilities, my trucks, and so forth, and they called me. And they said, we've just been involved with this live A concert. Uh, would you be willing to come work with, to come with us? And I said, sure. And I, I went to, meet, to a meeting with them. And basically what happened is I had seven weeks. I became the executive in charge of production. And I had seven weeks to put the entire production staff and crew together. And at that point, I developed a, a simple thing. If you don't like it my way, goodbye. And I, I took no no meetings or anything else like that. I just became a, a, a czar. And we just said, this is the way it's going to happen. And I made all the arrangements. And uh, I'm trying to remember, we, we had a, a satellite company that got involved with us. And I think we used like about 19 or 20 satellites to cover the entire world. And uh, we made a... Uh, we had a couple of countries that weren't able to carry the live show, and they said, we'll do a taped version of it. I said, well, if that's the case, we'll make you a taped version. And we made a four-hour meltdown of all of the best acts that were on, and that went out to about uh, 15 or 20 different countries. And I, as a matter of fact, still have the, that four-hour tapes uh, are still with me. And that's about the only thing I have out of this 60-year career that I've had. And I have some other little basketball games, but uh, nothing like uh, like that. The Live A concert was something unreal. We, we did some things on that that uh, nobody would have ever thought of being able to do. I remember in Philadelphia, 
when we parked all the mobile units that we were using because we had four shows running at the same time, uh, going out to four different networks at the same time. We had the ABC show that went on at night that did the, that carried it all night, well, all night as long, as long as it was on. Uh, and then I had an independent network that carried it during the day and we were feeding London uh, and all the rest of the world. Uh, or there were four different uh, shows going on at the same time. And we had almost a staff of about 225 people. A lot of that came from ABC, who supplied us with all the, uh, a lot of the technicians. And we had zero, it was so good, we had zero problems, personnel problems with anybody for that 18 hours that we were on the air. Everybody just pitched in and did that thing. There was nobody giving us any hard time or anything once we all arrived at Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, it was a hell of a deal. For me. I, I had a great time on it. And uh, there were some other little things, but it basically that was a great show. Well, um Clearly a stellar career in television production, especially in sports, uh, clearly uh, uh, punctuated, I guess, with the, with the Live Aid thing, which is, you know, probably a once in a lifetime thing. Um, before we wrap up, uh, it was. Any, anything you want to promote? I know you've got uh, not only your, your own firm, but do you also have a, uh, a piece of technology, I think, that's also part of that. Do you want to plug that and tell us maybe? Yeah, we, 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 de- yeah we developed, uh, uh, Jerry, my son and I, my son right now has been there, been with uh, Fox uh Channel 11 here in Los Angeles for uh, almost 42 years. Uh, he started when he was uh, about 18, 17, 18. And uh, he's been with them for about 40 years right now. And uh, we developed a, a thing we call the score box. And uh, there is, we have oh three or four other competitors out there. Uh, we've got this out to about 175 uh, individual producers who use it on all of their events. And if you're familiar with watching sports on TV, either across the top of the screen or in the bottom of the screen or in one of the corners or whatever, there is a, uh, there is a graphic and in that, there is a bar, uh, a, a graphic bar. And in that bar, uh, there is the two teams that are playing and there is uh, the colors of the teams. There's and there's a bunch of clocks again, depending on what the score, what the sport is. And uh, we, did, my son and I, developed that, and we've had good luck with uh, in selling that. We we've sold it, sold it. Uh, a lot of our competitors in that business are leasing it, and uh, it, it's it's a big number dollar wise, and. Uh, you ours, you can put sponsor logos and things like that on it also. So that's been good for me. Where and, where can people uh, find out where can people find out more about Scorebox if they wanted to? Uh, just you can go on the web or call me. <laughs> you can go on the web uh, and look on the Scorebox TV is the web address. Or any, or you or anybody wants wants one. Very happily call me on the phone, <laughs> and, and uh, we can we can set them up with something. Well, great. Well, so we'll we'll promote we'll promote that a little bit, and uh, if anybody uh, uh, for whatever reason can't uh, figure out a way to get the Scorebox TV to find out more, uh, just send us an email here at the show, and we'll we'll certainly give you Howard's uh, information for uh, phone number and, and contact. That, that's and fine. Yeah. Well, Howard, look, this has been uh, an hour and eight minutes of uh, tremendous goodness. I uh, can't thank you enough for for taking time out of your day and uh, and regaling us and, and maybe being dragged back into some of the uh, uh, the dusty corners of some of your television sports production history with, uh, with uh, TBS. Yeah, well, yeah. I, st- I started in a business when I was 18. I went to a school and I came out of high school in Glen Cove, New York, and I went to uh, a school in New York. I called the Television Workshop of New York, and uh, we had we had ninety nine percent ninety percent of the students in that school were all Korean War veterans who were going to school under the GI Bill, 
And there were just two of us, if I remember at the time, who, who were paying our way in. And that was a guy by the name of Larry Terrell and I. Larry wound up uh, running a television station up in Milwaukee. And I wound up putting about four or five stations on the air across the country. And that was because I had the experience, and the experience was only coming out of school. But uh, it was a, it was I was doing it at the right time for me anyway, and it's been a, it's been a great life. I have no problems. I am I've been retired uh, since uh, from doing directing and so forth since the seventies. No, not the seventies. I'm sorry, since 07, 2007, when I had a stroke, and that put me out of climbing up the steps to get into a mobile unit, and uh, that's when we. And then we started uh, the uh, score box uh, here, and that has helped. That has been a good deal for me right now. Well, Howard, thank I am you. retired. Yep. I'm retired. I'm living on a motion picture and television uh, fun campus here in Los Angeles. We got all uh, got all old people here: actors, uh, directors, uh, act, uh, actors, directors. Uh, Camera, uh, salespeople, all this stuff, everybody on the campus here, and there's probably about a thousand of us here, are all retired people, and it's been a very good life so far. Howard, thank you. This has been awesome. I appreciate your time, and I look forward to uh, keeping in contact, and I'll let you know when we get the show up yeah, on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything, anything I can do, and if I ever get some more footage, if that ever shows up, I'll be more than happy to. Again, we to, put that to out to you. We put that out to our audience to see if we can uh, maybe find some nooks and crannies of uh, of footage that might exist out there that eludes both of us. Yeah, I would love to have some of it. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Howard, thank you. Take care. My, oh, my, that was fun. Howard Zuckerman, thank you so much for uh, for taking time to talk with us and... uh, and again, you want to find out more about uh, Scorebox, uh, it's uh, scorebox.tv. And uh, of course, uh, if you want to find out more about uh, our little show here, of course, that's goodseatsstillavailable.com. That's the place for that. And of course, if you also uh, need podcasting help and production needs served, and please go to our friends at podfly.net, uh, Podfly Productions down in uh, Gadsden, Alabama Way, and our friends Jerry Payne, Eric Begay, Corey Coates, and David Gregerson for helping us out at Podfly to make this uh, production uh, as professional as humanly possible. Uh, Until next week, we want to thank you for listening and uh, take care, everybody. See you next week. is the TVS Television Network.